So you've got the theme for today, nature, heaven and nature sing. All right, one of the uh, themes of the, of the readings today is God continues to enlarge his grace to capture you and me in more and more ways so that we can't ever avoid or escape the fact that he loves us. And that is the one thing that we try to do really well. We are all at different times and occasions very unlovable people, and we know that, and sometimes we do it on purpose. Just because we don't want to be aggravated by being around too many people at any given time, so on different occasions we will just tick people off and get them away from us and out of our face, and we will just be alone and we'll enjoy our aloneness for a time. Uh, now, we do that with God all the time. Uh, you know, think about, the, think about the gift of grace, the gift of God's love as uh, one of the Christmas presents under your Christmas tree this year, if you had a tree. And uh, there's a bunch of you who opened the gift and realized that God loves you. And he loves you all the time. There's other of you who still have the present and you haven't unwrapped it and opened it simply because you're saving it for another time. Sort of like an emergency feel good moment. And there's others who have just trashed it and re-gifted it and never looked at it. And that is why God continues to enlarge the magnitude of his grace. Uh, you can see that the early Christians caught on to that fact real quick. Uh, and, and, all you, and this is what John was, was talking about uh, when he was talking about the uh, uh, God came. Uh, through the word, uh, they went right back to Genesis. So let me just read you a real brief section of Genesis from the, the message. First this, and it's from Genesis 1. God created the heavens and earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. By the way, who's the spirit rooted like a bird? What do we call that in the Trinity? Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? Hmm? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. Right? Like a dove, right? Okay, so you already have then one of the ways that God is active is by the spirit rooting over the creation. Now, the complement to you. And I don't mean compliment as in you're a great human being. <laughs> the complimentary part of that, the way God works in you, is by brooding over you and letting you know that he is brooding over you by giving you a conscience. So that when you are a screw-up, or when you know something has happened that just doesn't feel right in a relationship and you don't know whether you're being taken advantage of or manipulated, you brood over it. You meditate on it. You think it through. It's called conscience. All right. We think of conscience as, as being guilty or not guilty. The Bible doesn't think of conscience in those terms at all. It thinks of it in terms of your ability to comprehend, apprehend, and think through what's going on in any given relationship at any given time in your life. So that is one thing that God does to enlarge his range to meet you, is by means of brooding, giving you the gift of brooding through your conscience, decision making. Uh, God spoke light, and light appeared. Ah, and music spoke. Who is it? <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I thought you were going to answer it, so we know who it was. <laughs> Say hello. Oh. All right. So, who is when God spoke? Who is the speaker? <clears throat> what do we know Him as? God, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? The Son, right? The Word of God. So you now have Jesus already in the mix at the creation, speaking a word. And his word, of course, creates. And as a result, you are a creative human being by virtue of being formed and shaped out of nothing by the creator, by our Father, God. 
So you see, in the beginning of creation, the early Christians recognized that God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was present in the beginning and is present at every time in your life and will meet you because the magnitude of his grace in terms of its hugeness and his ability to get to you, uh, there are no boundaries for God. The only boundary that he has is the boundary that he will meet you with a word of grace and also continue to work with you and on you so that you too enlarge your boundaries of life. <clears throat> That's why the meaning, the root meaning of the word salvation is elbow room. All right, so that your boundaries enlarge so that you can embrace life with God's graciousness in the same way that he embraces your life with his graciousness. And uh, the spirit will meet you in terms of its creativity and its imagination and its life-givingness, and you will know the Spirit's presence, God's graciousness that way, at the times and occasions when you are a, either a dullard. Does anybody ever get dull besides me? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Nobody will admit to it but me. All right. Good job. Thank you very much for being so supportive. Appreciate it. <laughs> but when you're a dullard, when you're boring, when you just don't really want to be around anybody or think about anything, and you just think the whole world is miserable and rotten, and except for you, of course, uh, that is when God's imaginative Holy Spirit and creative Holy Spirit will cause you to trip or stumble over something to wake you up and realize that you have gifts to offer. And here's the key thing. Grace is always about giftedness. And so your graciousness from God will always lead you to being a gifter and using your giftedness to give gifts to other people in need of those gifts. Uh, the words that you speak will be based on that brooding spirit in you. And so your word, as God's word, Jesus, will be a word of grace. It may be a word of judgment at the same time, but the one thing you don't want to do ever, and you don't like it any more than I do, is when somebody hits you, zap, you're a jerk, <laughs> or you're not very nice, or you're really unpleasant, or I, oh, I love this. I had this conversation. This is great. I want you to change. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I want you to be different because I don't like how you are. Well, how do you get somebody to just change by drilling them with words? What are you creating? You're creating Frankenstein, a monster. Because people just don't change just because you think they should. It don't work that way. You don't function that way. So change is always a creating word, which means, and how long does it take to shape? And I'm not any good in clay work. But I, you know, I've watched people who, who are artists who paint and work with clay and sculpt like that, and I, and I envy them like crazy. But it takes them hours. And it's just not the hours of the creating of the actual thing they're creating, but the hours and the days of thought that go into it before anything even is begun. You see, the creating word is that gift which you have to offer to people also. A word of life. A word of grace. So you see then that you have a magnitude of grace surrounding you and in you at all times. You have uh, God acting as, as our original father and creator, calling you back to him because he will never hurt you or damage you. He will always love you no matter what. The second thing that will always be true is that you will have 
uh, the Holy Spirit, that brooding bird, internal to you, who will be acting as your spiritual director, as your spiritual director and your, and your moral compass, so that you have the guidance and the wisdom to know which direction to take and why the early Christians called themselves people of the way. Right? It was because they were going to walk in a certain way, in a certain fashion, uh, with a certain certain kind of behavior, a certain language, and a style of living. And then finally, the word, which you know uh, every word causes things to happen. If you, uh, if you go up to somebody and just say hello to them, and they're looking a little lonely, you know, a little out of sorts, you know that is a word of good news. Just to say hi to somebody who's looking a little disjointed and out of joint. So a word is always causing something to happen. And it never comes back to you without something happening. And that is why then Jesus was equated with the light. The word is, cre is, is equated with the light. And the first Christians through the first five centuries almost always talked about the word of God being the light. And when you think about your life and your creative words, you do in fact bring light to the people around you. Or you have the possibility and the invitation for God to do that, to be a light to the world around you. Uh, I was talking to, uh, to someone uh, in the last couple weeks uh, who had been pretty much I think given a word of darkness, you know, she was in a relationship and, uh, oh, I love you, honey, I love you, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to have a job, but uh, you're working full time, so that works out pretty good. <laughs> and then, to go with that, uh, oh, you got a new car. My car doesn't work very well. Tell you what, I'll swap. So I'll start using your car, the new one, and you can have the old one because you don't have to drive far to work. And oh yeah, by the way, I don't babysit our baby. You're not huh? You're not you said it's not babysitting. I know you said that. Well, you're right. It's not babysitting, but I'm a man. Remember that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's right. So you see, you see the kind of words there that are spoken. They are not good words. They are not life-giving words. They're not grace words. They're not upbuilding words. They're hurtful and destructive. And what, what do you think happened? Life got small. The magnitude of God's grace, which expands life, began to get small. Small, small. And then she heard the word of grace. And realized, I can't live this way because I'm a slave. I might as well be in Egypt making bricks. My language there. So she broke free. And now life will begin to expand. She'll begin to recognize God's grace. But guess what? Is it going to happen because she can do it all by herself, all alone, without any help from anybody, because I'm single and I'm free and I have some money and I can do it all by myself? No. That's an eight-year-old talking. When you're in your teens and when you're in your 20s and your 40s and 50s, it really looks as bad as it sounds when you act like an eight-year-old. <laughs> as an adult doesn't work very well and so it will take a communal faith to both offer those words of grace and also the activity of grace with the, all of the force and the power and the magnitude required to free a slave out of slavery and bring her to the freedom of the promised land it doesn't happen by magic. It happens because of the commitment that you have made to the world that God created 
And that is one of the ways that you know that God is present in you through that brooding bird because you are a creator of life. And that is your job and that is your calling and that is what you do as a Christian. And it doesn't matter where you do it. You do it. Out of nothing comes this new thing. A new person, a new being. And that is the, why the magnitude of God's graciousness is so broad and deep and rich both in and around us. It's his gift of life. And it's so magnificently broad that it includes the things we can see, that is, each other right now, and also includes all the stuff we can't see at all. All of the loved ones who talk to you at three o'clock in the morning. All of the ones who come visit you who have died 10, 15 days ago and you're hurting like crazy. And they come and visit you for about two or three seconds and say, it's okay. And then they're gone, never to reappear. Things unseen are all part of God's plan and part of his graciousness. We live in a wonderful and glorious and gorgeous world, and you know that as well as I do. You understand we're doing our best to mess it up, and we're doing pretty good at it. I must say, we've done stunningly well and continue to do great at being destructive of it. On the other hand, God has a plan, and his plan will win out. He will raise up the proper men and women to guide the world into a new way and a new path. We don't know who those people will be. We do know that they will have to be people of faith who recognize the beauty of life and the world that God created. Right now, it's all unseen. But God's busy working. Just look at the first lesson that they read. Understand, that was a prophecy that was spoken to a bunch of people in the 700 BCs who were exiles and slaves in Babylon. You would know it as Baghdad today. And what did he promise them? You're going home, baby. You're going home. And you're going home to your home. And I'm going to make it in such a way that you will have water along the way, and you're going to rock, you're going to walk on the main interstate highway to get there. Yes, there were interstate highways then too, and that's what they did. They got home. The magnitude of God's grace is big, it's broad, it's deep, and when He makes a promise, He keeps it. Now. What does that make all of you very simply? It makes you sources of light. <laughs> Whether you think of yourself as a light person, a light-spirited person, sort of misses the point. You don't have to be light-spirited. You just have to recognize in yourself that you have been created by God, chosen by Him as a source of His light. And that life is the light of the world. It's the light of life. And that's what you bring to the world you live in. Amen.